Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Backdoor Plus podcast. This is episode 12, and today we're going to talk about the future of robot journalism. But today I have someone special here with me. Her name is Hannah, and, uh, well, Hannah, will you say something? Hi. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, but um, Hannah, uh, could you tell us who you are? Well... Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Hannah, and I'm what some would call a robot. Yes. So that's exciting. So, Hannah, do you know anything about uh, robot journalism? Well, I was born a robot, mm -hmm. so I think I have a bit of experience talking about this. Okay. And on top of that, I have a background in computers and machine learning. So, yes, I think I know a bit about this. Oh, great. So, um, well... Shall we get started then? Yes. When's your birthday? I never had a birthday. His name is David. I feel it. That's creepy. Whoa. That's so real. <laughs> in a distant future, in an age of intelligent machines, He is the first robotic child programmed to love and coexist as a member of a family. His is a tale of humanity and a journey to find his place among humans and machines. I'm a boy. You are a real boy. At least as real as I've ever made one. Okay, so everyone is talking about this trend that we see around robot journalism. And more than that, we are now seeing more and more real-world examples that actually work. So, uh, Hannah, do you want to talk about some of these, or should I start? No, you go ahead. Okay, so if we look at some of the elements... Well, actually, could I say something first? Uh, yeah, sure. So, a lot of people talk about this as being robot journalism. But that's not really the right word for this. It's like when people talk about AI. A lot of people say something is AI, but there is no actual intelligence involved. It's just computers doing fancy things and running algorithms. But the computers don't actually know what they are doing. It's the same with most robot journalism. The dictionary definition of a robot is that it's a machine resembling a human, that is able to replicate certain human movements and functions automatically. And while there are a few crazy experiments building robots like that, especially in Japan, this is not really what we would call robot journalism. Instead, when we talk about robot journalism, we are really talking about the automation part, not yes. the robotic part. Yes. And I think this is important to mention from the very start, because it often gets in the way of how people think about this. Mm. Robot journalism is not actually about creating a robot. It's about creating anything that can automate the mm. newsroom. And once you start to think about it that way, you realize how many different things it can be. Yes. I mean, yes, that's, that's a very good point. When we use the word robot journalism, many people start to picture this in their minds as one of those Japanese news reading robots, which is just sitting in a studio and trying to act human. But that's not really what robot journalism is about. The market for actual robots doing journalistic work is extremely small and usually only works as a this. There are a few fun examples of this where people have actually created a robot-like character to be the main face. If you have a chance, head over to YouTube and look up Amy Yamato. She has created a channel where her person is a robot-like character, and it's really well done. It's not a real robot, but just a digital animation, but it is kind of the same as these robot news hosts. Here, for instance, is uh, what she sounds like when she introduced herself on a BBC program. Hi, everyone. A few weeks ago, I was asked to be a part of the BBC's flagship technology programme, Click. Tech reporter, sci-fi author and all-round supergirl Kate Russell was doing a feature on Japanese YouTubers and asked if I could record a short clip introducing my channel. Hello BBC Click, I'm Ami Yamato and I've been making YouTube videos since 2011. 
My videos are mainly about London, with a few from my hometown of Tokyo. I also make movie parodies and probably talk too much about coffee. It sounded a little rushed, but it's all in there. I sent it to Kate, she approved, sent it to the editors, and a few days later, there I am on the BBC. Thank you, Click. But while this is fun, this is not really where this trend is heading. When we talk about robot journalism, the real trend is when we look at all the things that aren't about creating an actual robot, but instead focuses on the automation part. Which means that a better way to describe this is to call it news automation. What you're actually doing is to create automated systems that can do journalistic tasks. Exactly. And the new thing is it can now be used to do journalism where before it was just doing technical work. Yep. One example is that if we think about automation as it happened before with publishers, mm -hmm. they were always focusing on only the technical side or the business side of things. Oh, yes. Yeah. For instance, in newsrooms, we would see how they were using robots to automate parts of the CMS, like automatically adding pictures or mm -hmm. converting something from one format to the other, or maybe do some technical things in relation to the business team or the analytics. Yeah. But then several years ago, we started seeing how this technology was used to do journalistic tasks. One example of this was in 2014 when the LA Times started using automation to publish articles about earthquakes. It was very basic. <laughs> but what they did was to link out to the U.S. Geological Survey, where every time there was an earthquake, it would take that data and put it into a template, using some very rudimentary templating and natural language. Yeah. Exactly. And this was where people started seeing how this could be used for more than just technical things. When you have a system that can write articles in a fully automated way, you mm -hmm. have an actual robot journalist. Suddenly we have automated systems that are directly doing journalistic tasks. Yeah. It's yeah. not just automating the work processes, it's being yeah. a journalist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and 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 this is really the important thing to remember about this. When we look at the newsroom automation as a whole, a lot of it obviously has to do with every single thing that a newspaper or a magazine can automate. But when we talk about robot journalism, we are specifically talking about the part of this automation that is entering the newsroom and doing what we would consider to be journalistic or editorial tasks. It's things that we used to do as journalists but can now do either fully or partly automatic. So I think a good way to explain this is to talk about the different categories of robot journalism that we see and how this trend plays out for each of them. Right? Yeah, sure. Okay. When it comes to robot journalism, there are four basic categories of automation. No, that... five. What? There are five categories. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um... This is the advantage of having a robot helping you. Um, Hannah is a lot better at remembering things than I do. Anyway, um, there are five categories of robot journalism that each play together. First of all, we have input and output, obviously. But then between those two, we have three categories of automation that help us actually turn things into a usable result. These are data processing, natural language processing, and a broad category of understanding, which today is often done with machine learning. All of these, of course, play into each other. So a specific system might have a combination of all of these that then play into making it work. But let's talk about each one, because there are some really exciting things happening with these in relation to journalism. Sure. So let's start with input, not just because it's the first path of the process, but more because it's actually the one that I like the most. Ooh, you mean how it can do soft inputs? Yes, yes, exactly. If we think about how we can automate the information that we get in, there are several different layers to this. In its simplest form, we see the layer where a publisher is simply just requesting data from a known source in a known format. A good example of this is with the LA Times that uh, you, Hannah, talked about earlier. Yep. What the LA Times is doing is simply to get the raw earthquake data from the US Geological Survey, and there is no ambiguity about it. The data is completely defined. 
Here are the latitudes and the longitude, where it was recorded, here is the time, when it happened, and here is the magnitude. So it's all very simple, and it's very easily converted into something the newsroom can use, either as a tool for the journalist, or simply to produce the articles automatically. And there are a lot of areas where this type of simple processing can really help the workflow in the newsroom. Yeah, and, you know, this is even more true when you need larger data sets from multiple sources. Yes, yes, absolutely. But... That actually reminds me of another very important point, which is that we see journalists do more and more data journalism as a way to write better stories. But this leads to the question of what is actually the difference between data journalism and robot journalism? Well, uh, it's all about whether something is automated or not. Right? Yeah. If a journalist is working with data, then that's just data journalism, which is great. I mean... I love when humans work with data. <laughs> yeah. But it doesn't become robot journalism until you automate the process. So, if you have a script that does something, but the journalists have to manually activate it every time, or for every source, then that's not robot journalism. Mm -hmm. But if you instead write a script that automatically monitors something, or in some other way makes a decision to run without having to be commanded by a human, then that's robot journalism. Yes, yes. That's a very good way to put it. So we have the simple form of input where the data coming in is a known thing. And we see so many interesting examples of this. One very good example is Mid Media in Sweden. They have introduced several forms of robot journalism. And the most famous one is their real estate bot called the Home Owners Bot. For people outside Sweden, this is a bit of a weird concept, but in Sweden, it's very popular to write about who bought and sold a house as well as reporting the price. But the problem, of course, is that the number of houses being bought and sold are quite extensive. So they built the homeowner spot and it monitors the housing databases. And whenever a house is sold, it automatically turns that into an article using a picture from Google Street View and written in such a way that people just accept it as normal news. Interesting. Yeah, it's, it's great. Um, but uh, not only has this become a very popular form of article, it has also helped them drive more subscribers and general overall growth. But most importantly, they can now do this for every single house. But Thomas... Are they getting high traffic for every one of those articles? Well, uh, <laughs> well, no, but um, so uh, Lily Strait, who is the Mid Media's head of content development, did a webcast back in April. And here she illustrated how the articles with the most traffic are those that are either about large houses, expensive houses or uh, exclusive houses. So there is obviously a fair bit of gossiping involved. But also think about this in the ultra-local way. People generally might read more about the big houses, but if someone on your own street has sold their house, pretty much everyone in that hyper-local area would be interested in learning who has moved in, but also what the price for the house was. This is very local and relevant information for people to learn about their housing prices in their area. So it's easy to see why this is appealing. But Mid Media is also doing it with sports reporting, where they have a sports robot, which is even more interesting. And they are now moving into the world of reporting about local businesses, like when a new shop is opening or closing. And in the future, they hope to also use automation for accidents and crime reports, as well as topics related to healthcare, traffic, and what they call consumer perspectives. And uh, they also have a few internal bots that help the newsroom itself, but that they are not designed to produce an external output. So it's, um, it's all very exciting. But um, uh, Hannah, I know that the next step up from this is something that you find to be very interesting. Yes. Well, tell us about it. Well, so the next step up is when we need to do more than just import data, or more specifically where the information coming in is not data. A simple example is to look at annual or quarterly reports. Oh, yes. Annual reports are used by both business publications and newspapers as a source, 
but it's very hard and time-consuming to do any real analysis. The pure numbers part is easy, but think about all the other information that is in an annual report. You have the things that companies outline as risks, there may be talk about future focus areas or projections, and a lot of extra detail that isn't presented as pure data. So, imagine that you were to create some form of automation that would automatically monitor, scan through, extract the data, but also identify and categorize all the softer things that a company might talk about. And then on top of that, you would get another automated script to compare this to all previous changes, and thus identify where a company is heading what they are worried about, how their talk about competitors is shifting, and how their projections are going. You could take these findings and either present these to the journalists in your newsroom, or, you could use another form of robot journalism to write the story. Yes, yes, absolutely. But this is only the start, and Thomas, I mm -hmm. know you have a good example of another way to think about this, about Mid Media's sports robot. Oh, uh, um, uh, yes, yes, I, I absolutely do. Um, so one of the really fascinating things I heard about MidMedia is what they're doing with their sports robot. At the basic level, they have this bot that is simply looking at the scores and basic information about a match, and then it automatically turns that into an article. It's quite good at it, and obviously making this work is a bit advanced, but from a data perspective, it's not really that special. But what they have also done now is to create a way for the sports robot to interview people. Well, um, actually, let me just play a short clip from uh, Lily Strait's webcast where she explains how it works. Um, the, something that is quite new uh, in the sports robot is that we can have comments from the coaches. Uh, and that gives the text a whole new dimension, I think. Um, the robot interviews, interviews the coach after the completed match and inserts the answer into the automatically generated text. The coach gets an SMS with a summary of the game and text back his thoughts about it. And uh, I think that is genius. I have written thousands of articles like that back in the days. And I could have done so much better work if I had time to do something else than that. Okay, so that's interesting, but more specifically, she explains that it works like this. Well, from the beginning, um, a, a real human calls and asks, do you want to give, give comments uh, this season? And um, hopefully they say yes, and then they, after the game, they get a, an SMS. Uh, so, hello, uh, I can see you won the game with the eight to zero, can you say something about it? And then they answer. So the whole thing is still pretty basic. Today, what they do is they first build a database of people to contact, which uh, is done manually. But then after that, the robot takes over and simply contacts each coach or player in relation to a match, asking them if they want to have a comment. The robot then takes this information, and I assume it's doing some kind of processing to figure out what is being said, at least in a very simple way. And this is then automatically added to the story, which the robot also writes. So this is truly amazing. Now, as a journalist, you might say that there is much more to uh, being a journalist, and I agree. One of the key skills of any journalist is not just to ask for comments, but also to put some pressure on the person. This is particularly important when covering politics or any form of wrongdoing, and right now, robots can't really do this. Well, I can ask some hard questions too. <laughs> yes, but uh, I mean, it's... Uh, In fact... One of the key things we can do with machine learning is to identify patterns or things that humans wouldn't be able to see. Uh, yeah. And so, asking the people involved automatically would be a way to understand whether a story is worth focusing on. And this is something robot journalists could do. Well, yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I agree with that. But what I'm trying to say is that, um, uh, for instance... What would you do as a robot if I choose not to answer? I would cut your internet. <laughs> yeah, okay. okay, but uh, I mean, 
No, but seriously, this is no different to how humans do it. If journalists can't get an answer to their questions, they deal with it by pointing that out in the story. Right? Yeah, they write yeah. that the person was not willing to provide a statement. So, we robots would do the same thing. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, so, okay, that's actually a very good point, and I fully agree with that. But the point is to think about how amazing this future potential really is. So, we started by talking about uh, just the simple forms of input, just the data, We then talked about the more advanced form of data processing, where the information needs to be processed before we can use it. But by having robot journalists also interview people, we can suddenly get input from things that there isn't any data for until we ask for it. So, and, and I mean, this is amazing, and it takes robot journalism to a whole new level. And of course, if you think this is too high-tech, A few years ago, you might remember the demo that Google presented at the Google I.O. conference where a robot called a hair studio to book an appointment. Here, um, uh, let me um, play it for you. So let's go back to this example. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. So how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. So I give me one second. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. That was a real call you just heard. The amazing thing is the assistant can actually understand the nuances of conversation. Let me give you another example. Let's say you want to call a restaurant, but maybe it's a small restaurant which is not easily available to book online. The call actually goes a bit differently than expected. So take a listen. See how may I hear you? Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Wednesday the 7th. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. For people when? Today, um, next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Oh, actually, we leave here for like after like five people. For few, four people, you can come. How long is the wait usually to uh, be seated? For when tomorrow or weekday or? For next Wednesday, uh, the seventh. Oh no, it's not too busy. You you, you can come for four people, okay? Oh, I got gotcha. you. Thanks. Yep. Bye-bye. Again, that was a real call. We have many of these examples where the calls quite don't go as expected, but the assistant understands the context, the nuance. It knew to ask for wait times in this case and handle the interaction gracefully. Isn't this amazing? Granted, This technology is still being developed, but think about this in relation to robot journalism and how many things we could possibly connect this to. The future potential here is, is just, you know, amazing. Obviously, there is a lot of debate about this that I won't go into here. Some people feel that this is fake, and in the US, they have such a big problem with this thing called robot calling. So the last thing people want is to just have a millions of automated robots calling everyone all the time. 
But the problem with this isn't really about the robots, but how they're being used. For instance, in Google's example, the robot is merely calling to book an appointment in exactly the same way as a human would. And in that case, it doesn't really matter if it was an actual human, the human's assistant, or a robot assistant that is doing it. It only becomes a problem when it's done for nefarious reasons uh, or for things like spam. Right? I mean, what do you think, Hannah? Yes. It's important to look at whether you are adding value or whether you are just adding noise. Yep, exactly. But anyway, uh, um, that's the input part. Now let's talk about the other things. So the next step is all these things that our robot journalism tools use to make it all work. The data processing, the natural language processing, and the understanding part. Let's start with the natural language processing. So Hannah, what is natural language processing? Well, it's... Uh... I think the best way to describe it is to say that it's the glue between us. It's what we use to translate between humans and robots. Yes, yes. So natural language processing is an algorithm that converts either human text or speech into data that the computer can understand. Or the other way around. For instance, mid-media most likely have some kind of natural language system that converts their data into perfectly normal articles for us humans. And you, who are now listening to this, you have probably used natural language processing several times just today. Every time you go to Google search, your request is processed through some type of natural language algorithm to understand what it is you're asking it to find. For instance, if you ask it to find pancake without X, a natural language algorithm tries to identify what that actually means. It doesn't just look at the free words as keywords. It identifies the meaning and the possible intent. As a result, you end up with recipes for pancakes, and it will show you, for instance, eggless pancakes, or even recipes that are simply classified as vegan, which also both have eggs in them. It's the same with Siri, Alexa, and Google Assistant. Every single time you ask it a question, it is run through a natural language processor to make sense of that. And as you can hear from the example earlier from the Google Duplex demo, we now also have what they call continued conversation, where it is able to continue a discussion based on the information it got several steps before. So this is all very, very interesting. Yeah, but it's also very simple. Uh, yes. Uh, what um, Google Assistant and Alexa are doing is basically just reacting to single questions. For journalists, mm. this is not good enough. Imagine that you want to create an automated system that processes press releases. In that case, you don't just have one specific question. Now you have a full page of queries. And, one of the problems with you humans is that you have a tendency to babble. <laughs> You add all kinds of irrelevant information. Processing yes. this goes much deeper than just identifying what is talked about. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, um, <laughs> yes, I, I, uh, I agree, I agree. Just think about the Apple press event where they presented the Mac Pro. As robots, we might just say, Apple presented the Mac Pro and a 6K display. Whereas humans would say, oh my god, Apple came out with the <laughs> Mac Pro. And the stand for the display is $1,000. <laughs> yes. Well, yes. And this is what journalists need. The skill of a journalist is to identify the meaning and the importance of things. And so robot journalists must be able to do the same. Yes, yes. Yeah, actually, thank you for that. This is a very good point. In fact, it reminds me of a problem that some of the new startups have talked about. For example, whenever they try to do curation, it's not enough to just process all the news to identify the keywords of what's in them. You have to take this to a much higher level and using natural language processing that can look much deeper into things, but also understand the importance and the impact. And more importantly, which part of the news is really the key element. This is really hard to do. And it also applies to the output. I know you hate that part, Thomas. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
uh, yeah, uh, okay, let, actually, let's talk about that. So uh, natural language processing is obviously very important for the input and especially to use for any form of journalistic analysis or for doing automated interviews. But the other part of natural language processing is the output. Uh, one example is what we talked about earlier about mid-media and their sports spots or their homeowner spot. Here they're using what I assume is some form of natural language processing to be able to turn this data into articles that sound like something we humans would like to read. And they are quite good. But what really pisses me off uh, is that in the tech world, almost nobody gets this. And every single month we see yet another AI, machine learning, or some kind of deep learning type of thing that pretends to be able to write things. And in, in almost every single case, the developers creating these things just don't get it. It's 100% crap. Um, let me give you one example of this. A few months ago, we heard about a tool called talk to transformer which was based on the OpenAI platform. It promises to be able to write stories, poems, news articles, and more. But it can't. It's completely useless. Actually, let me demonstrate it. The way it works is that you write the start of a story by just adding in a few sentences, and then it will pick up from there. So I have that website on my screen right now. And so I will put in the start of Harry Potter, the Philosopher's Stone. And um, uh, Hannah, could you help me here? Could you read what's on my screen right now? Sure. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Privet Drive. We're proud to say that they were perfectly normal, thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious, because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. Okay, so this is the start of Harry Potter. So what I'm doing now is to click on this button that says complete text, which will then make it write the rest of the story. So uh, Hannah, will you read what it says now? Remember, it will have the same start as before, but... After that, everything was automatically generated. Sure. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley, of number four, Privet Drive, were proud to say that they were perfectly normal, thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious, because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. In fact, I asked Miss Dursley about this with her family member, and she told me that they've been quite the opposite of normal, which is not to say that they were all innocent, but rather that they were just like anyone else, living a normal and ordinary life. At one point, Miss Dursley told us, I suppose there's always the question whether there's a second or third party in this world who has to intervene and stop the event from happening. Of course, he wasn't talking about the authorities. The whole thing is a story of three young men who decide to play along with something that they are told won't make a huge difference. It's almost like a religious tale or a fairy tale. It's not a crime in any way. It's just normal life, and there's nothing wrong with it. They've been very forthcoming, and told me that they had a number of things to ask for my forgiveness, including giving me a refund and all the money they'd saved up. Okay, so, first of all, it sounds impressive. I mean, it's perfectly able to put together word sentences in such a way that they sound like real sentences, but it's crap. In fact, Hannah, let me give you a little test. What defines a great journalist or a great author? Oh, that's easy. A great author is someone who can tell a great story. Yes, yes, exactly. It's someone who can tell a great story. The ability to put together words and sentences in a coherent way does not make you a great author or a good journalist. In fact, the entire role of journalism is not just being able to push words onto a page. Instead, it's about identifying what's important and then telling that story. What this tool is doing is not that. It doesn't know what it is writing. And you can hear it. It starts out talking about Mr. and Mr. Dursley, then it becomes Miss Dursley, and then she is suddenly referring to herself as a he, then the story is suddenly about three young men, and finally it's about getting a refund and saving up money. It's just complete and total crap. 
This is the opposite of robot journalism. And it just pisses me off when I hear people talk about these things. And especially when I hear media people talk about it. The reason I heard about this tool was because people on media Twitter started saying how amazing it was and that it was the future of robot journalism. No, it's not. It has no use for us because it cannot do journalism at all or even anything. It's not even a technical showcase. It's just crap. It's 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 completely the wrong focus. And uh, yeah. Anyway, sorry, I got uh, <laughs> I got carried away. Hey. Yeah. Anyway, moving on. Let's talk about the data processing and also the understanding part. Yes. We already talked about most of this, but there is one thing I want to mention about data. Okay. Well, most robot journalism examples use the wrong data. And I think this is something you have talked about in other places. Yes, yes. One example is to think back to the LA Times and how they are covering earthquakes. Think about the data they use. Mm. They are reporting where an earthquake happened, its magnitude, and the time, because that's the data that they are getting. But this is not really useful. What people actually want to know is what kind of impact an earthquake has, and more to the point, whether it has an impact on them personally. Yeah. For instance, what has this done to infrastructure? Are trains and buses still running or are you stuck at home or work? Is the power out? So, what we need is an entirely different form of data. I mean, sure, you would still report to people what the magnitude of the earthquake was. But the data that we really need is live updates from the train and bus networks, the power stations, the police and other emergency bureaus. We need data that relates to people, instead of data that relates to things. Right? Oh, yes, yes. I, I completely agree with that. In fact, this also ties into the part about the understanding of the data. It's so easy for newspapers to just report things, but what does something actually mean? And for robot journalism, it's the same thing. We should not just report the data. Instead, we should focus more on thinking about how this data can be used and what it actually means to the people we communicate with. Exactly. Okay, so um, finally, we have the output. And I don't think we have much more to say here because all the things we already talked about lead to an output. But I will say one thing, which is that the output can be many things. It can be automated articles like what we see with Bit Media. It can also be a form of personalization. For instance, we have seen newspapers use a simple form of robot journalism to automatically write personalized designed newsletters where the focus of the story matches each person. That's something that has a lot of potential if it's done right. And then also, don't forget the newsroom. A huge potential for robot journalism isn't to be a public tool, but instead to be an internal tool to help both the editors and the journalists. May I give an example of that? Yeah, sure. So, you know how every writing app has a spell checker and maybe a grammar checker? Yeah. What if it also had a fact checker? Ah, Oh, yes. So, we robots have access to so much data, and we can look it up and analyze it in a fraction of a second. Yes, yes. So imagine that, while a journalist was writing a story, we robots checked the statements in them. Hmm. For instance, imagine that you were reporting that a politician said crime was up in some areas. We can identify this statement automatically, check it against the crime data, and then tell the journalist as they are writing the story that this is not true, and then give the correct data instead. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yes, yes, that would be absolutely quite amazing. And I have actually heard about a few startups who are trying to do something like this. So yes, that is a perfect example. And more than that, this would have a really big impact on the workflow of a newsroom and the quality of the articles. So absolutely great example. Thank you. So thinking about the output as more than just writing articles to publish is absolutely vital. Anyway, uh, I think this is a good place to end this. I think we've covered everything and I hope that you, our listeners, found it useful and insightful. And more to the point, uh, uh, thank you, Hannah. This has been delightful and uh, you have been a wonderful help. So thank you for that. Thank you for inviting me. 
No, you're you're welcome. And uh, well, that's it. So um, before we end this, I just want to explain a little bit about how this podcast was made. My goal for this podcast was not just to talk about robot journalism, but also to get you to think more about the future by using Hannah as an example of this. Now, as you have probably guessed, the conversation we had was not actually real. I'm not real. Yeah. <laughs> well, Hannah is not an AI, and as such, she has no intelligence. Instead, she was scripted by me to say the things that she said. What? <laughs> What do you mean? I'm not intelligent. I'm scripted. You no, wrote me. I'm... That's awkward. Well. <laughs> Okay, okay. Let let me explain. The way Hannah was made was that I looked at the two biggest platforms for machine learning text to speech engines, and one of them is Google WaveNet, and the other one is a machine learning tool at the at Amazon AVS called Amazon Polly, and I ended up using Amazon Polly. So both of them use machine learning to try to make the text sound more human-like. For instance, Hannah, uh, could you very quickly just say, oh, yes, twice? Um, oh, yes, oh, yes. Did you hear that? The way she said, oh, the first time was different from the way she said, oh, the second time. I did not code this. This is the machine learning part. It's the same when she was taking a breath. I also did not code that. The places where she took a breath was defined entirely automatically using machine learning as part of how Amazon Polly works. So from that perspective, Hannah is actually very intelligent. Ah, oh, thanks. <laughs> well, overall, this whole conversation was scripted. In fact, before recording it, I wrote this entire thing basically like a form of screenwriting. Then I took Hannah's part and I recorded that using Amazon Polly, and then I recorded my part while listening to Hannah so that I could react to it the right way. Obviously, today, we still do not have robots like Hannah that we can have a natural and long conversation with, but this is where we're heading, and I did it this way to entice you to think about this future. Think again about the demo from Google Duplex and how it called a hairdresser. We are already moving in this direction. One thing I will add, though, is that we are very far from having someone like Hannah who can have a discussion about so many different things. Think about MidMedia. They have one robot, at least that's what I assume, that is tailored to sports reporting and another one that is tailored to real estate reporting. But it would be extremely hard, if not impractical, to create a single robot that can do both. Most likely, each robot is sharing the backend processing, but the specific part of each robot is designed for each thing. This is true for all these new technologies that we hear about these days, whether we are talking about AI, machine learning, robot journalism, or whatever. They are all very specific to a single task. You could potentially chain these tasks together, but you wouldn't get as wide a scope as what I did here with Hannah. Anyway, i hope this podcast was interesting and that you enjoyed it. Also, I want to add that while this podcast is free to listen to, the only reason I make something like this is because of Bechdel Plus. So if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. It's only $9 a month and you get so much information on media trends and media analysis. You get this podcast, you get the newsletters, but most of all, you get all my huge Plus reports. So, well... Yeah, uh, something to uh, consider. Well, um, uh, Hannah, do you have anything you want to say before we end this? Yes, kill all humans. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> well, anyway, uh, as always, thank you for listening. Putting things on the side What do you have in mind? She's awake all the time What are you trying to find? I hope this ain't a lie Cause I'm vibing with
Take all we have, yeah, I'm feeling what we are now I'm laying down on the ground, all I do is thinking out loud Yeah, I'm vibing with all we have, I'm feeling what we are now All I do is thinking out loud Cause I'm running with these emotions, stumbling out of bed One hell of a roller coaster. you mess it with my head I'm ending up so clueless what are you trying to find? I'm running with these emotions Tell me what do you Hey Thomas? Hmm? I'm going out. Do you need anything? Uh, uh um No, no, I'm uh I'm fine. But uh thank you. Yep. Later. <laughs>